I came to you from uh, 30 days in Africa. They're, uh, well, let's see, they're seven hours ahead, so they're six hours ahead of you in Cape Town. Uh, full of long jet travel and one night at home and then grabbing a plane and coming back to Atlanta after I was already here the Thursday before. And there is no way really to tell you just what a blessing you have been to me. Uh, if I ever felt more at home anywhere, I really did not know where it would be. It's been a blessing to get to be with Jody and with Matt and the praise team and Ruth and Beverly and your elders. I really appreciated that. I didn't know we could get elders together on a, whatever day it was we met, Monday, Tuesday, for lunch. And seven out of the nine were able to be there, and we had just such a wonderful time together. And I was so impressed because, like I said, on the Bibles for Africa thing, I really was so caught up in so many things that I'm kind of just doing the best I can as I got a little stronger every day from all the stuff in Africa, and they wanted to know all about it. And I wanted to know all about what you're doing uh, in all of your works and the stuff you're doing in world missions. You are a church that is on the cutting edge of world missions, and I praise God for that. we got a big job to do, church, and small thinking won't cut it. I mean, Jesus loves the whole world, and the Great Commission says to go into the whole world, preach the gospel to every nation, and uh, it is too, too often uh, that you find a church with a shrinking circle in which they're interested and I'm really impressed with what I have seen. And I'm in awe, really, of the treatment that you have given to me the time that we've been together. I just want to thank you for that. I want you to commend you to God in the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among those that are sanctified in Christ. Acts 20 and verse 32. And I've enjoyed all of the lessons we've given. Some of them may be deep and serious and some of them fun and funny. But it's all been stuff that we need to do. And I, I've been pleased to be a part of Family Bible Week. Family. We're never going to get stronger in the community than our families. Never going to get a stronger church than the families in the church. And America's never going to be stronger than its families. And that's why family values are extremely important because they're God values and God knows what He's doing. And tonight we make one more appeal because though I think that we're doing this job pretty well here, it's, it's, it seems to me that we are, we ought to constantly make it the goal that all of our families will be strong and that we will reach out in the community to people that are hurting. There are so many people that are hurting and show them a better way to live. And that involves being happy in a family, in a church family. So I want to read you a couple of texts, and we'll go into the lesson again tonight that is on be family anyway. The key word in our text tonight, in our, in our topic, is anyway. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Would you listen to Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 14? I'll give you time to turn to that if you've got your Bibles and, and want to turn to it, or just listen while I read the Word of God, Ephesians 3, beginning in verse 14. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom His whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of His glorious riches He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to Him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to His power that is at work within us, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And in John chapter 17, if you'd care to 
Look there a minute with me. John chapter 17, the prayer that contains the, the chapter that contains the prayer. The whole chapter is a prayer that Jesus prayed right before he went to the cross. I mean, he is facing death and he's not praying trivials. As he says in John 17 and verse 20, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I in you. May they also be one in us that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you have sent me. It was important to Jesus that we have family. It was important that we have unity and strength in that family. And I want to remind you that I'm going to be interweaving tonight both families. God so designed this that you would never be without a family. And that surprises some people because they think, hey, you know, my dad left me when we were small or my mother and dad separated, they divorced, or my dad or my mother died and all these things that go on. But God Almighty, looking back in the first chapter of Genesis and saying, what would really be good, realize that man and woman needs family. And God so ordained before the world was ever formed that you would never be without family. So he said in Genesis 2.24, for this cause a man shall leave father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two of them would be one flesh. And he guaranteed that that's going to be separated. Those two people, that man, that woman, stand before a preacher of the gospel and vow that they will be faithful and true to each other as long as we both shall live. And in the very vow that brings them together and begins the honeymoon of that marvelous marriage, it also says you're going to die one way or another. You're going to lose that family. And kids and families all over the places in fragments are looking for the family that they lost. And God said, you still need family. And so Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And he called that church family. It says in Galatians 3 and verse 26, For we're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. As many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. And so both families were laid out because God intended us to always have family. When you look out in the world today, you see a lot of strife, a lot of division, a lot of pain. And God's law was that family, both the physical family and the church, would be a place of security and a place of love and a place of provision and a place of acceptance and support and forgiveness and encouragement and fulfillment and peace and happiness and hope. And if we're going to have that kind of thing in our families, we're going to have to be family anyway. I like to explain the anyway philosophy a little bit later. But right now I want to say, well, we use the expression sometimes, blood is thicker than water. And that's a good statement because it means that we're flesh. That's my mother. That's my, that's my wife. That's my, that's my child. That's my parent. And, you, you know, they may have faults, but you can't say anything against them because blood is thicker than water. And we stay, we stick together. Now, we say that, and we know that that's so very important, but it really isn't always that way. In the book of Genesis, chapter 13 and verse 8, was when uh, God had said in chapter 12 to Abraham, Hey, I'm going to make of you a great nation. You remember that thing? Because the whole Bible in, in, in one little chapter in three verses was, was, was listed in Genesis 12 in verse 1 to 3 because God picked Abraham, gave him three promises. I'm going to make of you a great nation. I'm going to give you a land that I will show you. And through you and your family, all nations of the earth are going to be blessed. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the story, it doesn't get one chapter later until this uh, all happens and, and the families are going and, and, and Lot's got a, a, a nephew named, I mean, Abraham's got a nephew named Lot and they're going to the land God showed them and all of a sudden there was fussing and fighting like there is in so many places. And Abraham comes with an appeal. He doesn't really care who's right. 
He doesn't stand up for his own rights or insist that he has the right to be happy or that he's God's chosen person. He says to Lot, and we ought to learn this today, we ought to take off our shoes because the ground on which we're standing here is holy ground when he says to Lot, let there be no strife between us because we are brothers. Many, many years ago, one of the Bible department at Abilene Christian, J.D. Thomas, wrote a book, We Be Brethren. That's the way the King James put that. Don't let there be strife. It was an appeal to the church. All of these petty uh, uh, issues that divide us. The quick way that we quit speaking to one another. The quick way that we leave a church and go to another. The quick way that we split off a church with the excuse we think we can start a work over there and do a better work when God knows our heart. We just don't like those rascals and we want to get over and practice Christianity where we will have to see them. And Abraham says to Lot, please let's don't fuss because we're brothers in the family of God. Sometimes in our world today, it takes crisis to make us see clearly. I remarried a couple one time on their 13th wedding anniversary. They'd been married for 10 years and then divorced. And then got to thinking about the stupidity of the little things that they argued over. Of the pride that they couldn't get through. Of the selfishness that dominated their lives. And then they were... They were clear enough to realize we stood before God and we made vows and we're violating those vows and we want to get back together and be the people that God wants us to be. And they came to me and it was one of the neatest ceremonies I've ever had uh, the privilege to perform as on their 13th, three years of all this pain and misery and sin. And they were coming back together like Lot and Abraham to say, let there be no strife between us because God made us one flesh. And they appealed to each other and appealed to God and got it back together. Someone said life is too short to be small. Have you got a bad list? Has your friend done you wrong? Has your ex done you wrong? Is there somebody in the world that you haven't spoken to in years? Cavett Robert, one of the great speakers that I've had the privilege of being on on, on the program with, used to say, if we all knew that the world would end in 30 minutes, every phone booth in the country would be full of people calling somebody to say, I love you and I am sorry. But not realizing that, we, uh, we keep our grudges. We hold all these lists. We keep our filing cabinets full. And at a moment of notice, we can pull it out and say, in ought six, you did this. And on the anniversary, you did that. And, and you keep, oh, I forgive you. You know, I love you anyway. And we keep this great thing going, you know. And we've got all of these, this strife going on. And the wedding bells, as we've talked about, have gone from clink to clank to clunk. And, and we don't know the difference in giving uh, love and acceptance and forgiveness. And, and we've lost the triangle with husband and wife at the base and God at the top so that the closer we get to God, the closer we are to each other. Can we learn to be family anyway? I was telling the elders the background of this series on be family anyway. I have 13 of these. Be happy anyway, love anyway, forgive anyway, be family anyway, and then nine more of those. But it occurred to me on an airplane one day that I, I really believe the older I get, the more I really give people the benefit of doubt. The less I ask what and the more I ask why, the older I get. Because you oh, that's bad, and we start in. But why did the person do Why do your kids do that? And, and why don't people say, I'm sorry? And, and why do we carry grudges, you know? I really believe that down deep, because God made us this way, we all really want to be good people. And the preacher stands in the pulpit and tells us all these things we ought to do. And we know down in our hearts we ought to do them, but... And we cover it all over with the things that have happened to me. And all and we're re- reacting rather than responding. And we can't, we can't get around to breaking through that. And, we, and, and I realize that anything God asks us to do uh, is going to be anyway. There's always, there's always going to be a reason not to do it. There's always going to be an obstacle. Well, I can't be happy until, and this happens, and I can't forgive until. I'll forgive you if you'll come crawling to me. And maybe if this happens, and, and we keep all of this up, and anyone in the world that is happy or faithful or serves God or obeys God or keeps the marriage going, it's going to be an anyway situation. You're going to have to do it in spite of the obstacles, and we've got to learn to be family exactly the same way. Can you learn to stand by your family? Can you learn to stand by your kids anyway? It's more of a decision and commitment than it is anything else in the world. Now, we also say uh, uh, water is thicker than blood. 
You know, because Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You see, it's the new birth that puts us into the family of God. Everyone, listen to this carefully, because a lot of us in churches of Christ have missed this, doctrinally clear, but we've missed it. Every person on the earth that is scripturally born again is in the family of God. I was in a preacher's group one time in, uh, in Tulsa, and we were talking about our instrumental brothers, our brothers who believe this, believe that. And one guy stood up and said, they're not my brothers. And I said to him, the Lord didn't ask you. I mean, when you do what the Bible says, see, you can't argue with me tonight and say, Marvin, I'm not sure you're in the kingdom of God. Jesus made me a bargain. He made the same bargain with you. He gave two commands and three promises in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 and 47. Repent and be baptized. Those are clear commands that all of us need to do and can do. And he said, if you do those two things, I'll give you three. That's so like God. You know, he asks you two things, he'll give you three. But I'll give you the forgiveness of every sin. I will indwell you with my Holy Spirit, and I'll add you to save people to my church. Let me tell you who you're talking to tonight. You're talking to somebody who's been forgiven of every sin. You're talking to a Spirit-filled Christian. You're talking to a man, you're looking at a man tonight, who is a member of the right Bible church, and I know it, not because I'm so good or so smart, but because he's so good. He's the one who said, if you'll repent and be baptized, and I did that. And the reason I know I've got forgiveness and the indwelling of the Spirit and I'm in the right church is because those were promises of God, and my God keeps His promises. So we need to realize doctrinally, well, uh, I don't agree with them. Well, we don't agree with each other. Let me ask you a question tonight. Do you agree with everything you do? I mean, there isn't anybody here in this audience who would say, everything I do is right. Come on. If you've got problems with that, you're going to heaven anyway because you're not accountable. That's just all there is to it. <clears throat> so we have to understand that we're first in the family of God. For we are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ <clears throat> have put on Christ. And we've got to learn to love each other. We're talking now about being family anyway in the church of Jesus Christ. Let's give you a couple of things that we ought to talk about. They came to Jesus in Matthew 22, 37 and said, Jesus, it's a thick Bible. Could you please give it? This is the Marvin Phillips translation, okay, of Matthew 22, verse 37. But they said, come on, Jesus, all in pages. I mean, there's page 1143, you know. Could you please give us the Reader's Digest Bible? And Jesus said, okay, I'll give you that. Uh, The whole commandment of God, the greatest commandment of God, is to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second one is likened to it, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said some things are more important than other things. Sometimes we've been so doctrinally squeaky clean, and we forget the things that Jesus said are a lot more important than these issue things. And He said the whole commandment of God is that you love God with all of your heart and that you love your neighbor as yourself. So we've got to love God, we've got to love each other, we gotta, and we've got to love ourselves. Because the Bible says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. It says in 1 Peter 1 and verse 22, that we've been born again, not of corruptible seed. See that you love one another with pure hearts fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. In 1 Peter 4 and verse 8, it says, above all else. I don't know how many years I was in the church. Uh, Making all these commands equal, you know. Uh, Whether I smoked or not is equal to being baptized or the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible clearly says some things are more important than others. And I've been in the church many, many years where they'd say, all of God's commands are equal. Well, they are not. And the Bible says they are not. Well, what's the big one, Lord? I want to be concerned with the big ones. When I stand before God, I want to have done the big ones. I want Him to say, Marvin, you made a lot of mistakes, but buddy, you came through on the big ones. Do you want the big ones? And Jesus said, Above all else, love one another, for love covers over oh, a multitude of sin. I mean, are you a sinner? Do you have any problem with that? If you say, no, I'm not a sinner, don't worry, you're going to heaven. You're not accountable. That's all there is to it. You know you are. And the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we all need help. And Jesus said, if you love one another, it covers a multitude of sin. And before Jesus went to the cross, he said... I need you guys to get it on straight. I'm going to give you a new commandment. Oh, Lord's going to give us a new commandment. And he said, love one another. And they said, looked at each other and said, he said that. He's getting senile. He said that before. And then he said, no, love one another as I have loved you. Let me give you some homework. 
here is a real good Bible study. Just go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. See, you can just forget the other 23 uh, books. Just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and see how Jesus loved. See who He loved. See that Jesus loved anyway. I mean, He loved me, and if He loved me, He had to love me anyway because the Bible says all things are naked and open under the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. He's heard everything I've said. He's watched everything I've done. He knows the thoughts and intents of my heart and loves me anyway. So Jesus loves me anyway, and then He tells us we've got to do exactly the same thing. I've got, you've got to love like I love. And John 15, verse 13 says, Greater love hath no man than this, lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus is calling upon His church to say, Hey, baptism is important. Don't you dare make light of that. Communion is important. And wearing the name of Jesus is important. And a lot of other commands are important. But you won't be known in the world by any of these. They will not say, I know those are uh, true Church of Christ people, blood-bought Church of Jesus Christ because of their view on Bible authority or because they do or do not use instrumental music, these things may be important. He never said that. Pay attention to what Jesus did say. All men will know you're my disciples if you have love one for another. Somebody was coming in on some of our preaching one time and said, Boy, we can preach on love so viciously. We can't. We don't love one another. You know, we say to each other, he said it right, brother. We've got to start doing it. Come on. Come on. You know? You, you, you want to do it like Jesus said. And he's saying, I'm looking at my church, and I wrote what I wanted, and I wanted what it wrote. I want you to have a proper view of Bible authority. I want you to teach it. I want you to follow it. You are going to be judged when you stand before God by the things written in the books. But the thing that will determine where you spend eternity more than your understanding or your performances, do you love one another? See, the big thing in the campus Church of Christ is do you guys love each other? And do you love the little children that are hungry so that you feed 200 of them a day? And do you love people when they walk in the door and they're wearing all kind of different clothes and they're not, I don't like them earrings in the ear, boy, and I don't like hanging all all that hardware on, you know, get out of here, you know? And you've got to go read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and see what Jesus did when He was hanging around people that were outcasts. Well, Jesus was talking to a woman one time with a belly button ring and a tattoo on the back of her head. That's in the Marvin Phillips translation, but that's Luke. That's Luke chapter 7. And isn't it funny, the things that impresses Jesus is our love, our compassion. And, and Simon, he says to this Pharisee, this religious leader, I mean, you've got to see this scene. If you don't visualize this scene, you're going to miss this. But in Luke 6, Luke 7, in verse 36, it said, Jesus said to a Pharisee. Now, they weren't all like this, but Pharisees were usually the, you know, with the chin in the air and the fingertips together, eyelids half closed and adjusting their halo. And Jesus said, I'm going home to eat with you today. And the Pharisees said, mm-hmm, VIP, I'm going to really, really show him something. Like a lot of us like to do on a Sunday morning. We're really going to show you, God. We look pretty good, don't we, God? Ha, 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 how'd you like that? We really impressed you, didn't we? You know, it amazes us what really impresses God. So there's the Pharisee. And according to 36 to 50 in that chapter, it says that he got all the china out and he he got the servants at the door and he's checking everything, Simon, because he's entertaining the greatest VIP that has ever walked upon the earth. And while he's got everything right and he's checking the servants and checking everything, there walks in a prostitute off of the street. And she was wearing a dress that was split up. On a clear day, you could see forever. I mean, the woman was out of place. Haircut, you know, and smelling of the perfume and all of this kind of gear. And she sits beside Jesus, who's reclining Roman style, and begins to cry. And the tears of her eyes fall on his feet. And she gets down with her head and is wiping off the feet of Jesus. And Simon is saying, get her out, get her out. He never changes that frozen smile, that Marvin Phillips smile you guys talk about. He says, get her out, get her out. Hello, God bless you. Get get her, get that woman out of here. And Jesus says, Simon, let me get a few views here. What the Pharisee saw when he looked at the woman. What the visitors at the dinner saw when they looked at the big dinner that they were all blessed to be a part of. But see, the view we want is the view of Jesus. Because we look around here and say, man, you seen our building? It's a lovely building, by the way. And you're fortunate and great to have it. 
see these pews and see this carpet. Hey, and you see, you know, and this and that, and you see all the things that we're trying to impress people with. And what's Jesus impressed with? He looks at the prostitute who is a pork chop in the synagogue, let me tell you that. i got to tell you, the time I used this lesson as a visual aid at Garnett, I had it set up with one of our guys who was a linebacker, young linebacker, and one of our black sisters that walks with Calypso in her soul because she's from the Virgin Islands, you know. And I said to her, I overdone it because I said, you need to look like this woman, girl. She did. She did that. I mean, the slit was clear up to here. You know, come traping in and swinging those hips. You know, she did a little much. But right at the moment when I had this set up, I said, open your Bibles to Luke 7 and verse 36. And I started to read, and Aaron, with her on his arm, walked in the back door and said, Hey, Marvin! And I looked at her. Everybody looked. Everybody looked. You know they looked. And he said, look who I got. And I said, uh, uh, okay, Aaron, uh, let's read Luke 7. He said, no, listen, Marvin, look who I brought to church. And I said, Aaron, come down here. And they pranced all the way down the aisle, all the way to the front. And she sat down in the front row and crossed those legs. And he walked up in the pulpit, you know. And, and I said to him, leaned over and said, of course, in the microphone, where did you find that woman? He said, in the red light district. And then neat? She propositioned me. And I invited her to the church. Isn't that neat? And I said back to Aaron, where did you get the idea a woman like that would be welcome in here with us? And he said, Luke 7, and went over and sat down. And everybody got to point, and I said, maybe we better read Luke 7. What is God impressed with in this church? I mean, you've got a lot of organization and a lot of things that churches all over the world could point to campus and say, boy, that's a neat place. And of course it is. But understand that Jesus is not looking at any of the things we think He's looking at. He's looking at, do those people have a love for each other? And not, not just say so. I love you. You love me? Yeah, I love you. God bless you. And I'm burning up on the inside. and I don't care two figs what happens to you. There's a verse that Ruth and I were talking about tonight with Tommy and Donna. It says in Romans 12 and verse 5, we belong to each other. Isn't that a neat verse? A couple of years ago, my phone rang at 3.30 in the morning. And the voice on the other end of the phone said, Marvin, Dad is dying. Can you come to the nursing home? I said, you bet, Kim. And I, I threw on my jeans, got in my truck, and drove down to the nursing home where her dad was dying. He died that night. <clears throat> Between the time she called me and the time I got there, she'd had time to think. And when I arrived there and jumped out of my truck and started in, she met me out there, out the front door, and she said, Marvin, I'm so sorry I called you. I forgot that you are retired and you don't have to do that anymore. And I said, Kim, I didn't do that because it was my job. I did that because of who I am. And that's a marvelous verse, guys. We belong to each other. Now, having said that, don't call me at 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> Unless you really need me. And if you really need me, don't you dare not call. Are you hearing me? And I'm speaking for Jody and Matt and the, and the, and the, and the, and the team here and the staff and the elders. Please understand they're normal people and they need their sleep and they need this and that. But when you need them, this is what the church is all about. And Jesus said, we've got such an uncaring world and pain-filled world. Don't get hung up on instrumental music. Don't get hung up on some of these rituals that you've got. You just stay loving each other with all of your heart. And the world will know there are the people of God. And they'll be crushing down the door to try to get into your place. The Bible says, as we therefore have opportunity, let's do good unto all men, especially to the family of believers. Here's some verses to consider. Listen, in the church, Jesus said in Matthew 5 and verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they will obtain mercy. It's easy for us in the church to point the finger. 
Well, she got pregnant, and that's wrong. The Bible says this. Here's what the Bible says. Hey, you know, and you say, well, what's wrong with that? We've got to preach what the Word says. Of course. But tempered with what the Word says, how about a little mercy? How about understanding that what somebody, you know, we talk about unwed mothers. Never talk much about unwed fathers, do we? It really helps you have two to make, create that situation. They brought this woman taken in adultery. Where's the dumb man? You know? We got this, when women do it, she's a slut. When men do it, he's a playboy. You know, we've always had that stuff. And the Bible says what we need here is some mercy. You don't negate the Word of God, but you take the sinner and understand that they are still loved of God. And here's a place where you'll always be accepted. Can I tell you a story? I was in, in our multiple staff office one, uh, one day. A call came into the reception. We got receptionists and secretaries and, you know, in-laws and outlaws and all the things that we got, you know. And the receptionist said, Marvin, you need to take this call. And I took this call, and the guy said, I'm calling from California. Does your church accept people with AIDS? That'll clear your sinuses. I said, let me tell you, first of all, yes, now let's talk. And, you know, and I wanted him to know, yes, of course we do. Don't quibble about that. Of course, Jesus will take anybody in. He'll take anybody back. You better say yes. And the world better know that you would say yes to any kind of situation like that. And then we began to talk, and it was a long, horrible story. By the way, that guy right now is dying of AIDS and won't talk to me. That's the bad end of that story. But we talked for a while over the phone, and then I said to him, Okay, when are you moving to Tulsa? And he said, Oh, I'm not moving there. I just needed to know that somebody would take me. I think there are people all over Atlanta who don't think anybody would have them. Why, well, I've been married and divorced so many times. Why, well, I have one lady said to me, have done everything written in the books and a bunch of things they haven't put in the books yet. And I couldn't tell you what I've done. I couldn't even begin to tell you what I've done. And the church is to be known by, we're to be family anyway. And so we, if we get Dr. So-and-so and Mrs. Moneybags, and if we get this and that, we'll feel like we really have something, you know. And we need money bags and, and Mr. Intellectual and all the others in the church, but they all need to be family anyway. And there needs to be some compassion. And in the words of Jesus, if you give out mercy, I'm going to give you mercy. You don't give out any mercy. You don't get any. In Philippians 2.14, it says, Let all things be done without complaining and arguing. And isn't it wonderful that in this church there's never been any of that? Nobody ever complained. Nobody ever argued. We say to our denominational friend, why can't they see the clarity of the Bible? How come we can't see that one? That's just pretty clear. That's like the old way we used to study the Bible. Brother so-and-so, read verse 14. Do all things without murmuring and complaining. Brother so-and-so, what do you think that means? I think it means just exactly what it says, you know. <laughs> and we ought to be able to see some of these. I had a sermon one time years ago called, Why Can't We See? We're saying all the time, Why Can't They See? And then some of these things come along so simple to us. And then, oh, let me show you this one. In 1 Corinthians 6, 1, would you turn to that just for a moment? This is what we've got to get in the church. And sometimes we, we really do forget this one today in today's world. I've seen it happen in my own congregation. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 6, 1. If any of you has a dispute with another, dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints. And it says a little bit down at verse 5, I say this to your shame. Is it not possible there's nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between you? Rather you suffer harm than to take your brother to law with brother. And then I retired. And they were in there negotiating my, you know, I'm, I'm a weirdo. You've already found that out. And please do not say amen at the wrong time. But they were working out the details of my retirement package. You know, and one of the lawyers among them said to Marvin, if there's any dispute here, you pick, uh, we'll put this down in the, in the written. Uh, you pick an arbitrator, we'll pick one, and we'll have one neutral person. And we'll, we'll just, I said, oh, hold, hold it. No, no, no. Well, what about 1 Corinthians 6? Don't take your brother to law with brother. Oh, they explained to me, no, but in today's world, you can really get hurt, and there can rise up other elders that know not Marvin Phillips. And all of that is the truth. All of that is the truth, but it doesn't take... 1 Corinthians 6, out of the Bible. And in spite of that, we still have brothers within the church taking the whole community to task. There in the campus, Church of Christ, they've got these guys arguing and fussing and fighting in court and trying to get each other's money. i tell you what I did. 
Dot and I went down to a notary public, and I just wrote down a simple statement, under no circumstance would we ever take the Garnett Church of Christ to law. And I signed it, she signed it, and they put the stamp on the thing. And I had this, this lawyer say to me, you're going to regret that someday. I don't think so, because the one that takes care of me is going to do it regardless of what you do. God said, didn't he seek first the kingdom of God? I'll take care of you. Isn't that what Matthew 6, says? So then there's so many other verses. Let's read just a little bit more now. And I just want you to, let's read a little scripture. In Ephesians 4, in verse 29, is some of the ways that we've got to be in the family. And we're going to have to be this way anyway, in spite of. Well, but sometimes they don't act like brothers, we say. And does that change the Bible? Well, sometimes we need to do this or that. No, what we always need to do is what the book says we should do. So it says in Ephesians 4 and verse 29, listen to this, just real good. doesn't take any comment, though being the preacher I am, I'll probably give some. Don't let any wholesome talk come out of your mouth. But only that which is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Hey, don't, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. You think we ever grieve the Holy Spirit? Ah, oh, you can hear the Holy Spirit going, ah, what's wrong with him? You were sealed with the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness. And yet someone says, He did that to me 29 years ago. And if it is the death of me, I'll get him back. And it probably will be the death of you. It's funny. Grudges are a lot harder on the grudger than the grudgee. I'm going to tell you that right now. You're over there wearing, oh, look at him, look at him. And he's having a great time, see. You need to be reminded nobody's getting away with anything. We all stand before God and He fixes it. Get rid of all bitterness, get rid of all rage, get rid of all anger, get rid of all the brawling, get rid of all the slander, all those things that you never see happen in the church. Along with every form of malice. And look at this. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. And you just want to go, hmm. That just feels real, real good. These are the ways we are to act with each other in the family of God. Here's these these verses to consider. It takes unity, I read John 17, to win the world. Jesus said, Father, I pray that they might all be one in order that the world may believe. So you've got to see that Satan's best chance of ruining God in his way and his church is to get his church not being in unity together. I've got to tell you about Venda. I think I told the elders about it. I just come from this little, well, it's not a little province. There are a thousand schools in Venda. North, northeastern province, right in the corner of, of South Africa, by Mozambique and, and Zimbabwe and Mozambique, right there on the corner, you know. And, and uh, I may have told all of you this. I'm, you've got to forgive me because I'm forgetting all these things. But we went to a four-hour discussion. Did I tell you that? Oh, I think I told the elders. A four-hour discussion of... Uh, an issue that was troubling the churches. And they called the whole church together to discuss the matter. But among all of that, I'm thinking, oh, man, they're just like we are back at home. We, we fuss about the most trivial things. And we make non-essentials essentials. And we major in minors and all of this stuff. And here I am. It's happening here up in Venda. And then I realized two things. Number one, they all had their Bibles out. And it was a Bible study, and they sincerely felt these two sides of an issue. And four hours later, when they did not agree with each other, They left saying, but we must not let this interfere with our unity as brothers and sisters in the family of God. And they all hugged and amened and that's exactly right. And they went away with their human understanding, not not fixed, but with their attitude of being in the family of God intact. And we just frankly have to have that within the local congregation. See, we got to, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Isn't that right? All right? And the main thing is leading people to Jesus. So in this congregation, we don't care if you're outvoted about painting the doors green or repainting the parking lot. All we care about is are we doing enough to reach lost people and leading them to Jesus. We've got to learn to be family anyway. We've got to learn to stop having grudges against one another. They're not godly. We've got to stop splitting and dividing over trivials. We've got to stop talking about one another behind their back and to realize that getting this, how do we get this? Getting this is more of a decision and a commitment than anything else in the world. I've got to tell you that my wife and I uh, raised these three children, these two boys, this girl, you know, and we followed the thing like I've been trying to teach you here. Uh, We don't disagree in front of our kids, and we don't let the kids divide us. 
So once in a while, my wife will say, we need to talk about this. <laughs> get in here. And we get away with the kids, and we come out arm in arm and say to the kids, your mom and I have decided. And they thought we were the fourth and fifth members of the Trinity. I've got to tell you that. <clears throat> Never see us disagree. We're always together on the decisions. And then the last one, Tammy, goes off to college. And most of them go off to college, get a mate, and leave. She did not. She came home. And uh, that was nice. But she came home, and we'd let her guard down in these four years that she was at Oklahoma Christian College. So we were, we were sharply disagreeing over an issue that, of course, I was right in. And Tammy saw, Tammy saw us, you know, and she's never seen that before. Well, she said, out there in the world, over at college, there were kids that their moms and dads had separated and divorced over differences. And she said, you know, it went through her mind. Would my mom and dad? No, they never would. And Tammy came to me and said, Dad, now I know why you and mom will never divorce, and I know the reason. And I said, whoa, that's big because your mom and I are just humans. And anything that happens to other people can happen to us. So why is it you think we would never divorce and you think you know why? And she said, you have a commitment to each other and to God. And that's more important to you than anything else. And that isn't nearly right. That's exactly right. And we've got to have that. More than anything in the world, we've got to be committed to each other and committed to the Lord. So, so last of all, how do we learn to be family anyway? It's like singing anyway. Here's the Apostle Paul on my sermon Sunday morning, and they're praying and singing praises unto God, and they're in jail, and their backs are striped with, uh, with, with the whip, and they're, they're, the food was bad, and the treatment is bad, and they're probably going to be killed, and they're singing. You see, they're not singing because there's nothing else to do or there are no obstacles. They have determined they're going to sing. They're just like the little girl that was happy, and the guy said to him, Oh, little girl, why are you so happy? And she said, I made up my mind to be happy. And that's what will make us happy today. So it's like that. Singing anyway. It's like washing feet anyway. Jesus' disciples were acting ugly. I mean really ugly in John 13. Asking who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. And Jesus wanted to say, well, I'll start all over. But instead he takes off his outer garment and wraps a towel around his waist. And the Son of God washes their feet. Jesus, was that easy to wash their feet? I don't think so. I think he was washing their feet anyway. By the way, I'm really for foot washing. And some of you, have you ever been in, in a service anywhere that you did that? Any, the young people do that a lot, don't they? Raise your hand if you've ever been around a thing like that. Ah, so good, so good. It's so biblical. And we'd worry he might split this church over foot washing. Would that be a sight when Jesus is on the side of it and telling you to do it? But see, the thing about foot washing is that, it, that it's an anyway thing. This person's feet, first of all, is dirty and smelly. And they've done you wrong. And all these other reasons why you shouldn't. And Jesus washed their feet anyway. And we've got to have the anyway attitude in the church of Jesus Christ. And it's like forgiving anyway. One lady said to me, well, I'll tell you what, I can't forgive them because they haven't repented. You know, and I said, well, maybe you're going to have to do like Jesus. Hanging on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. So if you forgive somebody, it didn't be because you've got real good reason to forgive them. It's going to be because you're doing it anyway. And the same thing is true in, in being family anyway. Uh, Jesus uh, teaching on the second mile. Oh, and there's other things. I'm, just, I'm not going to read all of it. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go to Romans chapter 12, read you a few verses, and we're done. In Romans chapter 12, I want to get at verse 9 and just read you a little. Okay, I'm going to try not to comment on this either. We just read. But it says in Romans 12 and verse 9, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. 